many thank you for that very kind introduction. I am acutely conscious that it's Friday evening, and it's getting quite late. I'm the person who's keeping you away from the chocolate brownies outside, <laughs> or a bar somewhere nicer. Um, so I'm going to try and be fairly short, but I wanted to start off by saying that I'm very deeply honoured to be here today, not only because I'm following after the great Ralph Nader, and I'm a very, very profound admirer of the works of Laura Nader, but also because I've spent many years of my life feeling quite guilty talking to anthropologists, because effectively in the last 15 years of my career, I've been something of an undercover anthropologist. I am passionate about the value of anthropology, and the way that I define the value of anthropology is quite similar to what Ralph Nader just said. It's not defined so much by the location where you study, it's not defined so much about the theories you ascribe to, it's really in my mind defined by at least three core things. Firstly, that anthropologists tend to look at power structures. Secondly, that anthropologists look a lot at discourse, at rhetoric. And thirdly, anthropologists tend to take a very joined up view of the world, partly because they tend to look at the world bottom up as a result of participant observation. And they tend to not be captured so much by tunnel vision, they tend to look at how the different pieces of the social system interact. So those three elements of anthropology, to my mind, are fantastically important and valuable in trying to understand the world. But although I started my career as an anthropologist and did field work both in Western China and then spent several years in the former Soviet Union doing field work in a very classic way as an anthropologist up in the high mountains in a village, um, when I joined the FT and started working in financial journalism, I have to admit that I tended to rather skip over, if not conceal, my unusual background because I was traveling around the world writing about high finance writing about government and financial politics and economics, and most of the people who I met back then looked at anthropology, as a senior banker once said to me, as a rather hippie discipline. <laughs> and although being a hippie might be a good thing in Berkeley, it certainly wasn't the usual kind of thing that one much should claim in Wall Street, Washington, or at the FT. But the key thing is that since 2007, I think that attitude and that perception has started to change. Before 2007, there was a very, very strong presumption in the corridors of powers and the financial markets that the only things that really mattered were numbers. If you couldn't put it into a computer spreadsheet, if you couldn't make a clever computer calculation or model with it, then it didn't really count. And the kind of degrees that commanded respect were things like economics, MBAs, astrophysics, things like that. But since 2007, since the great financial crash, it's becoming increasingly clear that there is a reason why credit markets come from the Latin word credit, or rather from credere, meaning to believe, which is fundamentally a social construct. Finance without faith simply does not work. Numbers matter in the sense that Numbers are part of economics, and money makes the world go round, or so they say, and at the end of the day, numbers have to be analysed to understand how the world works. But at the same time, an appreciation of the social fabric, of political systems, of cognitive maps, is incredibly important. And in particular, if you go back to those three points I raised, in terms of the defining features of anthropology, namely an emphasis on power structures, on rhetoric, ideology, and an attempt to try and look at the world in a joined up way. All of those three factors are very helpful in trying to understand how and why the financial crisis came about. Yes, on the one hand, you can look at the financial crisis in terms of an enormous financial bubble that was stoked up by too much liquidity in the system and some crazy lending practices. The numbers, as I said, matter. But you can also go back and look at the way that the power structures essentially allowed an elite group of bankers and financiers to exercise incredible untrammeled power in terms of rent seeking, or we'll call it plunder if you like, into um, what Professor Maffei was talking about, and essentially capture a system to their benefit. A number of anthropologists have looked at this with great effect. I mean, David Graeber's work that I admire enormously 
debt the first 5,000 years, has looked at the way that creditor, structure, creditor relationships are embedded in power structures and create and um, continue to perpetuate power structures. Keith Hart, another anthropologist who's done some very interesting work looking at power structures. Karen Ho is another person who's looked at Wall Street and tried to analyze the power structures there. So power structures were absolutely critical to the financial crisis. But in addition to that, the question of rhetoric or ideology was also central. When I was doing my academic work, I was very deeply influenced by the writings of Pierre Bourdieu, the French anthropologist and intellectual, who made the very basic point that the way that any elite stays in power, the way that a power structure maintains itself over time, is not merely by controlling the means of production, but by also controlling the way that people think. And what matters is not simply what people say, but also what they don't say, the social silences. Again, it's a point that Ralph Nader made earlier on. And looking at what people say, the dominant rhetoric, or rather what they don't say, is once again incredibly important in terms of understanding what happened with the financial crisis. Back in about 2005, 2004, 2005, at the Financial Times, I first stumbled into the world of complex credit. In many ways, um, it was a bit like going into Tajikistan to do my studies back as an anthropologist, in that I crashed into a world that not many people were looking at or knew much about, a world marked by a very strong sense of its own identity, its own networks, its own language, if you like. And I used to joke that if I could learn to speak Tajik, I could jolly well learn to speak CDO speak. Um, although I think it probably weighs some ways financial speak is harder than Tajik. But it was a world that had a very strongly sense, very strongly defined sense of its own cognitive map and rhetoric and ideology. And looking back, what's fascinating today was that in many ways that rhetoric and ideology, which was so incredibly important in stoking up the financial crisis, was marked by some huge intellectual contradictions. I mean, just to give you a couple of them, um, back in 2005 and 2006, Wall Street used to wrap its behavior very much in the cloak of free market ideology and very much with reference to the great Adam Smith. If you go back to Adam Smith and look at how he actually wrote about capitalism, capitalism and markets, he used to point out there were at least three defining traits of them. You needed to have a vision of ownership and management in companies, you needed to have free access to markets, and you needed to have free access to market prices. That's kind of how classic capitalism works. Of course, if you go back to Wall Street in 2005 and 2006, what you see is that almost none of those three factors were actually present. You didn't have free access to markets. You had a pretty dominant cartel of banks who were controlling many types of financial flows. You didn't have effective elision of management and ownership in the sense that bank shareholders were pretty irrelevant. And you also didn't have free access to market prices in many, many key areas. There was a fundamental intellectual contradiction. Again, another example that I cover in a book I wrote about uh, credit derivatives markets was that much of the development of financial technology, much of the innovation in finance that occurred after 2000 was justified by this wonderful phrase, market completion. It was a concept developed initially by people at groups like JP Morgan. And there was this idea that if you innovated enough, you could create products that would create the perfect free market and credit risk could be traded across the world and priced perfectly in a way that actually would reflect the perfect um, owners of that risk and allow everything to be part of a perfect liquid market. Karen Ho, again, has done some fantastic work in looking at this ideology that was used to justify so much of this activity. The problem, though, was that by 2005 and 2006, Many of the products that had been created as a result of this innovation had become so fantastically complex that actually it was impossible to trade them at all. I mean, if you looked at CDO, CDO squared, all these bits of jargon which came to dominate the industry, the reality was they were so complex, there was almost no free market, market in them because there was such a small pool of traders. So although banks and hedge funds were operating according to so-called mark-to-market principles, they actually had to use models to price these instruments because there weren't enough markets to actually get proper market prices. There was a fundamental contradiction in the ideology 
that was actually used to justify so much of the financial revolution and so much of the bubble. Now, if you look back and say, well, why did these conditions happen? Was it because the bankers were all evil, greedy, and bad, and they cooked up some kind of rhetoric, a bit like the Soviet Union, to kind of justify what they were doing or whatever? You know, it's very tempting to sit there and say this was all part of a plot. In fact, as it happens, I don't think it was really part of a plot because so much, again, to go back to Bourdieu, so, so much of what was going on was sort of semi-conscious. That's that wonderful quote from Upton Sinclair, the novelist, saying, it's very hard to get a man to believe if his job depends on not... Sorry, it's very hard to get a man to understand if his job depends on not understanding. Social silence, the act of turning your eyes away, the act of living with half-truths which go unchallenged was absolutely central to what was going on. But there was another factor too which was absolutely central, which again is where anthropology comes in, which was the complete inability to take a joined up view of what was actually going on in finance. The finance on almost every level back then was marked by a sense of tunnel vision, or marked by a sense of siloization. Silos were absolutely prevalent everywhere across the system. Inside banks, you had silos in the structure of banks, which made it very hard for any individual bank to take a joined up view of risk. Across the market as a whole, you had competing banks, which meant that essentially it was very hard for anyone to look at flows across the entire marketplace. The regulatory structures, which were supposed to be monitoring the financial system, echoed that fragmentation and intensified it. You had regulators and central banks that were incredibly fragmented and once again made it very, very hard for anyone to actually take a joined up view of what was going on. Or to spot these fundamental intellectual contradictions at the heart of the rhetoric that was used to justify so much of the financial activity. In a sense, what was needed so badly was basic anthropology tools. If there had been a few more people in the system who were looking at the power structures, looking at how the rhetoric and ideology that was being used to perpetuate those power structures and trying to take a joined up view, the type of deadly tunnel vision that occurred wouldn't have become quite so dangerous. And I really think the financial crisis would not have spun so badly out of control, or rather the financial bubble. But it's not just the story of the past. I mean, as I say, I happen to think a few more anthropologists around in finance could have done wonders to try and pierce the bubble and pierce some of the self-deception that was going on. Today, if you look at the financial system and you look at the development of the economics, I think, again, there's a tremendous need for anthropologists to get involved and try and bring their unique perspective and framework to bear in terms of trying to make sense of what's going on. Again, I'm conscious that time is pretty short, so I'm just going to say point to three things very briefly. But there are three particular areas where I think that anthropological understanding could help enormously in trying to understand the world, in addition to the kind of areas that Ralph Nader's talked about that are linked to specific policy issues and specific issues of social justice. Um, I like to call them the three C's, if you like. Um, one is a question of credit, in the most basic sense, meaning the question of trust, to go back to the Latin term. Something I find fascinating today is that you can look back at the last few years of the financial crisis, very much the story of the decline of trust in institutions and decline of trust in, in society. Um, before 2007, something that was quite dramatically um, striking about the financial system was just how much trust was placed in a tiny coterie of um, te technical experts, i.e. bankers. And in a sense, it was blind trust because most people did not have any idea what those bankers were actually doing, and yet they somehow trusted that it was going to be good for everyone and good for the system as a whole. Since 2007, what you've seen is a very dramatic unraveling of trust, first in the models and the tools of structured finance and financial innovation, then unraveling of trust in the banks themselves, unraveling of trust in the regulators, and now to a certain extent, unraveling in trust of government, and in particular the central banks and governments who pumped money into the system to try and keep modern finance going. And if you look at surveys in terms of how the population does or does not trust those institutions, it's very striking to see the level of decline that's taken place, not just back in 2007, 8, and 9, but today as well. There was a fascinating survey recently put out by a group called Edelman, 
which shows that there's been a really quite extraordinary decline in trust in government in the last year, following on from the earlier decline in trust in banks, both in the Western world and in the emerging markets. The only area where trust has actually risen has been in terms of people's trust in people like us, i.e. social networks, their peer group, and trust in technology. There's been quite a rise in trust in technology, which again I find fascinating. But these are very fundamental questions, um, or rather they raise very fundamental questions in terms of how societies operate and how they function. I mean, societies where there are no, is no trust are societies which are plagued by very, very big problems. And the question, if you look at the global economy today, or even if you just look at America, the Western world, is how do you recreate trust? And how is trust shifting? Because, as someone like Professor On points out, culture and trust, or culture is not a static thing. Cultural assumptions, cognitive maps shift. And anthropological perspectives in terms of how trust is currently developing in a country like America would be truly fascinating, not just for anthropologists, but also for wider wider academics as well, and they'd also have wider public policy messages too. Second area where anthropological insights have a lot to offer is on the issue of cohesion. Again, that's a kind of word which was almost never banded around in economic circles or financial circles before 2007. But as the financial crisis has developed, the question of cohesion and how it does or does not operate is absolutely critical in terms of trying to look at economic policy and look at governments and look at how societies are developing. I mean, back in the late 1990s, I worked in Japan during the Japanese financial crisis. And something used to strike me very forcibly then was that in many ways, Japan as a society had a tremendously powerful set of cultural um, tools and techniques for maintaining social cohesion, even under pressure. And there was a very strong sense of burden sharing, of shared sacrifice. There was a very well-developed ability to share out pain and ensure that everyone continued to buy into that society. And that played out on many levels. Um, I remember going to talk to a senior Japanese banker during the Japanese financial crisis, who told me that he had to cut 20% off his wage bill. And he turned around and said, well, of course, I'm going to cut everybody's salary by 20%, and my salary by 30%. And I said, of course. And there was a pause, and he went, well, if it was England, I suppose you'd cut 20% of the workforce. And there was another pause, and he said, well, if it was America, I suppose you'd cut 30% of the workforce and pay myself 20% more. <laughs> important point about Japan's ability to have a culture of shared sacrifice. I'm not making a value judgment here, I'm simply trying to describe it. And it's impacted behavior in ways that stretch from the Japanese government bond market. I think it helps to explain one reason why Japanese institutions keep buying JGBs no matter what, through to the way that Japanese society has maintained a level of relative peace even under <laughs> economic stress in recent years, even through to the response of the earthquake. And that is, is also born out of a sense of resource constraint, a culture which has a very strong <coughs> idea that resources are limited and finite, also tends to be a culture which develops traditions and, and practices to try and share out those limited resources. America, by contrast, is in many ways at the opposite end of the spectrum, a country founded by pioneers that came to America very much believing that the sky is a limit so there is no such thing as resource constraint. If you run out of land in the east, you just kind of go west, young man, and keep going. And there is always more. You can always use immigrants or innovation or conquest to get more lands, to create more and more resources. And if you have a history of always focusing on expanding that pie, you never need to worry too much about how to divide the pie up. You kind of assume that the pie will always get bigger, and so everybody will kind of get swept along. And in many ways, American cultures today, at least insofar as it's played out in Washington, seems to have a real paucity of institutions and mechanisms to address the issue of how do you divide up a pie if it's stagnant or shrinking? It's very hard to talk about allocating pain in America today 
within the political discourse, because there's been, in some ways, very little tradition of doing that. And that plays into the question about the fiscal debate. It plays into many of the questions that economists are looking at. And it's, again, an area where anthropologists could actually offer a lot of insights, particularly in talking to economists. Europe, in many ways, is an even more mixed bag of issues, and it's even more pertinent, because not only is the question of social cohesion critical inside countries, and it's playing out in very different ways between countries like Ireland at one end of the spectrum, which do have a high level of cohesion, and places like, arguably, Greece, which have far less cohesion, but also the question of cohesion across the Eurozone is becoming increasingly important too, particularly when you look at what's going to happen with the development of the Euro. But the third area, and this is my last point, where anthropologists can play a very valuable role in stimulating debate is on the issue of complexity, the third of my three Cs. Because one of the great paradoxes of the world today, in my view, is that on the one hand, we live in a social system and a, and a world where things are increasingly interconnected. I mean, you look around the world today and the systems that have developed, you look at global supply chains, you look at financial markets, you look at telecommunications, and you see a, a world where we're so interconnected that if something goes wrong in one corner, the shock can be transmitted across the system very, very rapidly. But the great paradox is that while we're living in an interconnected world, we're also living in a world that's marked by increasing fragmentation, both structurally and cognitively, in the sense that you've got fragmentation between different interest groups, you've got people using social media to only talk to people like themselves, you've got fragmentation between technical experts and elites who understand issues no one else understands, and as the world gets more and more complex, the ability to actually master the level of knowledge you need to understand all the different corners is getting harder and harder. That creates huge dangers. I mean, the financial sector and what happened with the financial crisis in the recent years epitomizes this in an extreme way. You had a tiny group of bankers going around creating innovations that almost nobody else understood, nobody else was watching, and yet when it went wrong, it managed to infect the entire system with a speed that took almost everyone by surprise. But it's not just a problem of finance. If you look at the energy sector, you see once again a tiny coterie of experts with knowledge that almost nobody else understands, who are doing things that no one else knows about until it goes wrong and affects us all. I mean, how many of you in the room had the foggiest idea what BP was up to on the seabed of the Gulf of Mexico before it all went horribly wrong? How many of you have the foggiest idea today of what's actually happening in the laboratories doing all kinds of genetic engineering, all kinds of biomedical experiments, etc., etc. We may not know until that goes horribly wrong, and we suddenly wake up and see the systemic implications. How many of you actually, to go back to the issue of trust in your Blackberries or trust in technology, how many of you really understand what's happening in the internet? And if the Blackberry systems all went down tomorrow, or your iPhones, how many of you would actually know what to do to actually replace it? Once again, we are thrown back 